gracias por participar de la tercera edición de Fiction Factory en Ventana Sur. Ventana Sur cumple 10 años, eh, por suerte ya estamos en una cifra récord de acreditados, con lo cual este, es un muy buen festejo, a lo cual sumamos que las conferencias, que, de las 40 conferencias que tenemos durante la semana, este, las que hemos tenido han tenido también un gran éxito de público. Así que este, estamos encantados de que estén participando en lo que creemos que es para Argentina y los latinoamericanos este, un gran evento donde nuestros talentos eh, audiovisuales eh, pueden encontrar su contraparte que permita que los mismos se desarrollen y se produzcan. Desde ese punto, eh, Fiction Factory eh, está dedicado a series de televisión, que claramente hoy es este, el predominante este, en cuanto a inversión global. Eh, y de hecho, eh, acá eh, por suerte podemos tener eh, reunidos en la sala a los principales jugadores eh, del mundo para escuchar los proyectos eh, nuestros. Eso es algo que hemos logrado con el tiempo y con el apoyo de todos ustedes y de una política pública, que es la que voy a pasar a explicar desde el punto de vista del INCA, eh, que me toca presidir, que está basado en una famosa eh, pirámide en la cual para nosotros eh, que veníamos de heredar un modelo en el cual el Estado argentino eh, invertía o ponía el 100% de los recursos en series de televisión y se quedaba con el 100% de los derechos, pasamos a un sistema en el cual eh, el Estado nunca pone el 100%, eh, deja que este, otras partes privadas o públicas eh, apoyen este, los proyectos y se pide que haya una pantalla, cualquiera sea, en las diferentes modalidades, que asegure que lo producido se ha exhibido eh, a la mayor cantidad de audiencias. Esos son los concursos. Al mismo tiempo, introdujimos el concepto de desarrollo. O sea, increíblemente, eh, nuestra ley, que genera el Inca, eh, tiene 60 años y lo único que había, aparte de subsidios, incentivos a la producción de cine, era eh, concursos de guión. A partir de nuestra gestión empezamos no solamente en serie de televisión, sino también para documentales y para ficción eh, a apoyar los desarrollos y lo más importante, no solamente apoyarlos de manera que este, los productores pudieran mostrar de mejor manera sus productos eh, a interesados, sino que también en este lugar, en Ventana Sur, este, invitamos a que puedan pichear esos este, desarrollos o proyectos a la mayor cantidad de gente interesado y de eso se trata no solamente Fiction Factory, sino también nuestro Animation para animación, Blood Window, digo porque acá transcurre Blood Window para cine fantástico y, este, y, y ficción por, todo, por toda la, la UCA. Esto ha llevado y quería compartir con ustedes a casos de éxitos el uno de los mayores ha sido Blood Window, cine fantástico que lleva siete años, eh, donde el Inca apoya un showcase de, latinoamerican, de producto latinoamericano dirigido a la, al cine fantástico, al terror, y que en 2016, si no me equivoco, un proyecto eh, working, ganó un Work in Progress que se llamaba Aterrados, después ganó un concurso de fomento para poder hacer la película y este, participó en Cannes, la película terminada este año, donde se vendió a muchos países y a muchos este streaming, pero lo más importante ahora es que acaban de firmar eh, con el nombre de Terry Fight, con Guillermo del Toro, para que haga la remake de la película. Este es un ejemplo, creo, de un apoyo del fomento público desde el comienzo este, hasta el final, en un género que... Creemos que la manera de también este, mostrarse al mundo, pues, nichearse y no competir en lugares donde hay mucha competencia y por eso espero que 
también de acá de Fiction Factory tengamos ejemplos como venimos teniendo de ese tipo. Con esto termino de hablar y paso a hacer la presentación, que yo no la veo. Voy a pararme acá. Vivimos un cambio real en el consumo audiovisual. La producción de series se ha vuelto la prioridad de los grandes players internacionales que invierten millones de dólares al año en proyectos de diversas escalas. Desde el Inca trabajamos para acompañar esta nueva tendencia y en solo dos años ya fomentamos más de 311 proyectos entre desarrollos y producciones. Para ello, generamos un esquema piramidal de fomento que estimula el vínculo entre una productora argentina, pantallas asociadas y coproductores que generan contenidos para vender en todo el mundo. ¿Cómo funciona este esquema? Es una pirámide de tres segmentos que a su vez se dividen en dos líneas de apoyo, producción y desarrollo. La parte inferior de la pirámide está destinada a series cortas. En este segmento, el Inca otorga hasta el 80% del presupuesto para la producción y el 100% del presupuesto en desarrollos. En la parte media se ubican series con modelos intermedios de producción. En este caso, el Instituto aporta hasta un 70% del presupuesto total presentado para la producción de los proyectos ganadores y el 50% para desarrollo. Por último, en el sector más alto de la pirámide, conviven dos modelos de concursos, con distintos requerimientos y diferentes topes de financiamiento. En ambos casos, se fomenta la coproducción entre una productora argentina y una pantalla internacional. El primer modelo, el concurso de promoción industrial, otorga hasta el 30% del presupuesto total presentado para producción y el 50% para desarrollo. El segundo modelo apunta a aquellas pantallas internacionales que decidan filmar series en Argentina en coproducción con una productora local. Se les reconoce un 50% del presupuesto ejecutado en el país con un tope, traccionando así jugadores internacionales a trabajar en Argentina. Inca ya destinó subsidios para fomentar 130 producciones de series y 180 desarrollos lo que posibilitó el desembarco de productos más competitivos en el mercado audiovisual con casos emblemáticos que han generado industria y trabajo calificado, posicionando a la producción local en el mercado mundial. Inca. Contenidos argentinos para el mundo. Bueno, me queda solamente presentar... Eh... Y ojalá puedan aprovechar todos estos talentos que han venido, a, que acá veo de izquierda a derecha, derecha a izquierda, Ángel Zambrano, a Esperanza, a Sidney Borjas, eh, Esperanza Garay, no sé está, y este, ¿cómo? Y presentar a alguien, primero agradecer a Miguel Esmirnov de Prensario por este hacernos el contacto con Roy Ashton. Roy Ashton, eh, si no pudieron leer su currículum, creo que es un lujo en el sentido de lo que necesitamos todos nosotros, que es un pitching para que nuestros productos eh, se luzcan. Realmente, eh, muchas gracias Roy por venir, por aceptar y te dejo todo el auditorio para vos. Please. Yo quiero eh, aprovechar este minuto para eh, darles algunas ideas sobre lo que queremos hacer, lo que se quiere obtener acá y que ustedes aprovechen al máximo esto. Eh, la presentación de Roy en este momento es la que corresponde a la posición de las agencias, que son las agencias de contrataciones con las cuales trabajan los estudios de Hollywood y las cadenas de televisión de los Estados Unidos cadenas de televisión de los Estados Unidos y los estudios de Hollywood no aceptan, salvo excepciones, presentaciones personales de creativos que propongan a ellos eh, hacer un determinado proyecto, sea una serie, sea una película. Todos los proyectos deben pasar a través de las agencias, hay una, poca, una escasa cantidad de agencias que tienen contacto directo con ellos y a través pasa. Roy 
es, eh, socio de una de las agencias y una de las autoridades en la materia. Eso por un lado. Por el otro lado, la mecánica de esta sesión está pensada así para que ustedes la puedan aprovechar al máximo. Bueno, sin más, lo dejo a Roy Ashton con ustedes. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, and for uh, I, I, I love uh, the coming to organizations like this because I think it's so important now to have uh, a global. It's so important now to have uh, a global perception when you are a writer or a producer, um, and it's and it's something that you know the the TV community is becoming very small now because people from all over the world are, are doing shows and you can make a show locally uh, that can go around the world and you can make a show, a global show, the idea being to sell it to Netflix or Amazon or uh, now Apple TV is coming in. Uh, Google is, is trying with YouTube Red. Um, you know, CBS is trying very hard. So it's, it's a very good time for all of us to be doing this business. Uh, so we should talk about sort of what how it works and what are the mechanics of putting together the right projects so that you guys can all sell. Uh, you can keep selling locally because it's very important and we can talk about that but also selling globally uh, because that's that's a, a critical part of I think the future of television. Do you want me to talk about agents? Yes. Okay, so very simply put, what an agent does in the United States, it's different than anywhere else in the world. Um, we, we are the the main gatekeeper, we are the main um, connection to everything. And what I mean by that is not only do we represent writers, producers, actors, directors, everything, we also represent books, we represent formats from other countries, we represent articles. We have a business, we have in an agency, it's not just I represent, you know, I, I sell TV shows, so I represent writers, producers, directors, and actors, but It's really the, um, we have a book department, we have a theater department, um, we, have a, we have a story department. A story department is, they do nothing but look for articles around the world, they look for uh, life rights. Um, we're always constantly, constantly looking for that. We have a branding department, a branding department talks to um, all the corporations, so in other words, um, We recently got the rights to, I don't know if you guys know Atari. Do you remember Atari, the video games from the 80s? So they have 4,000 things in their catalogs. Um, you know, I've worked with uh, Hasbro, the toy company. Um, you know, there, there are many different ways to do TV shows. And, and so we represent all of that. And we talk to all the people that, that may have anything that, that could become ultimately a TV show or a movie. Um, You know, we, we, uh, I work with the writer who did uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, and you guys probably, I mean, no one thinks of it now because you think it's such a big movie, and unless you were at Disneyland or unless you had children at Disneyland, and I didn't have children at the time, but someone, it was a very popular ride, and someone said, hey, let's make a movie. And they sat with a bunch of writers, and finally the, the you know, these two guys uh, who were partners came up with the idea, and it's... Uh, you know, become a multi-billion dollar franchise around the world. It's become a very popular thing. So we basically, as agents in America, will do anything, take any idea, no matter how small or, or how big, and we try and make it into a, a TV show or a movie. And we're the only country that I'm aware of that does that. In the UK, uh, the agents don't even, um, and the UK is a very active market. Germany, the same thing. Those are very big markets. Um, The agents don't do anything uh, as far as like a, a British agent, if you represent a writer in England, they'll get a job, a call for a job, and maybe they'll send people in, but they're not going to have their clients meet with anybody. So in other words, if I represent a writer, I want my writer to meet producers, the ones that I work with and the ones that other people work with. I want them to meet with all the studios, all the production companies and all the networks, all the always. And a, a writer in, in my world, I go, you know, every time you're writing something new or you're coming up with ideas, always, you know, trying to figure out what you can sell and what you can bring to the marketplace. In, in, the, in the United Kingdom, they, they don't do that. They don't set their clients up with each other. They don't take um, a writer and, and set, you know, 10 meetings with producers to sell a show. The writers and the producers do it themselves, which I, I think it's a little bizarre, but that's how they do it and in Germany the, the agents don't get involved at all so 
So I, I think it's an important part of, of uh, the business, and I think as the business grows, maybe there'll be more agents in, you know, here and other countries that might do a little more, uh, you know, to get to get projects moving uh, and to sell them. But right now, um, you know, it's important that, that you guys all uh, talk amongst each other, you guys all meet each other and connect at conferences like this, and so I think that's a good way to go. Okay, so uh, we're are we on the first slide? Is the first slide up there? Um, you should be seeing up there the idea. Do you see it? Now? The idea, okay. So <clears throat> when you're selling a show, it's the most important thing is obviously, is this an idea that people want to, to watch, right? It's, it's got to be different than what's on television now. It's got to be somewhat unique. Um, you know, there there are, and that's why some of the things why, you know, in, in our world, in, in the United States market, about two-thirds of all TV shows are based on IP, right, intellectual property. They're based on books. They're based on formats from other countries. They're based on life rights. Uh, or they're, we're doing a lot of uh, reboots. So I don't know how many people are watching American TV all the time, but Lethal Weapon was a very big movie in the 1980s, and they did three movies, and, you know, it started Mel Gibson and Danny Glover. Um, that is now a TV show. Um, MacGyver has been uh, tried four times now as a TV show, and, and this time it worked. Uh, so now it's on the air. So we're doing, you know, ideas can come from anywhere. Um, you know, but the most important thing about intellectual property is that it has some kind of a track record. So if you have a book that's a great story, that's the most important thing. But at the same time, a book that's not such a great story, um, you know, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, which was a big book a little while ago, a network bought that and said, we'll give you three seasons. And there was no writer, there was no producer, there was nothing. But it was such a big book and it was so popular, uh, especially with the female audience, which is most of the networks in America, the female audience is a little bit more important. You know, a little more, females watch a little bit more TV than men. Um, sight unseen. They said, we'll give you three seasons, which is very unusual. But it was such a big book. And then you have also, uh, you have a, um, you know, uh, how do you, like a track record. You have um, something that's proven in the marketplace if it's a book, right? So, um, again, sort of like the Pirates of the Caribbean was a big ride at, at the most popular amusement park in the world, Disneyland. Okay, maybe we try this as a movie because people like it so much and let's find a good story in here and let's make a, let's make a movie. So the idea is important. The idea also being something that's relevant in the marketplace. So, um, you know, in, in, um, in America right now, uh, you know, the family show is, is sort of coming back. And so there was a show about three years ago on NBC called This Is Us. And there was no other family show on TV. And this was a, you know, very important family story, um, you know, three generations. Uh, you had, you know, love, you had tragedy, you had everything in this family show, and it was the most, it's the most popular show right now in the United States. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is that we're having a lot of conversations about female empowerment. Uh, so when you see The Handmaid's Tale, uh, that was, you know, the, the woman who directed the pilot had never directed anything in television. Um, a, a, a man wrote it, but it was based on a book. Um, and, 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 and funny enough, that, that's a very popular show. It's winning all the awards. It won the Emmy. The director, she won the Emmy. Uh, the actress was nominated. I don't think she won. Uh, they're nominated every year for everything. Um, and that's a story that's it, it's perfectly in the zeitgeist right now. You know, we have a lot of, um, you know, the Me Too movement, which is sexual harassment in, in the workplace and, and f uh, a lot of female... Um, uh, issues that are coming up in the, in the workplace specifically. So The Handmaid's Tale is a perfect thing to go to the marketplace. It's the perfect idea to take to the marketplace. The others are, are diversity. Uh, diversity has become a huge thing and obviously we had a president for the last eight years that was uh, our first African American president so it was it was a really, it was the time to come out with a lot of diverse stories and so those are the things that are making. But you have to connect to ultimately what the audience is looking for. So you have to find that connection. And the networks all want to be, um, they, they want to be ahead of it a little bit, but it's very hard to be ahead of it. And I don't think they, you know, no one can really tell what that is. So you do want to connect with the themes that are 
current and in the present day. It's very important to do that. Um, the pitch. So the pitch is, is literally the most important thing in our marketplace in that uh, you, you have to be, you have to tell them what a pitch, you have to tell them everything about your show in a pitch. A pitch is 10 or 15 minutes at the most. Um, you can get into a little bit of a conversation, but they schedule pitches for a half hour and they hear from nine o'clock in the morning to six o'clock at night, they're hearing nothing but pitches. That's it. And a lot of um, people at the network say, I know in the first minute or two minutes if I'm buying this pitch. And so what I do, and I, I um, we'll talk about it more in the workshop, but there's a way we started um, uh, crafting a pitch. And we, we started about about 10 years ago, I used to bring in my clients and, and hear the pitch first before it would go out to the marketplace because sometimes you have a great idea, you have a great writer, everything's there, but they cannot tell, the, they can't say what it is in the room. So we constructed a, a, a sort of a pitch pages where it's, okay, this is what you do in a pitch, this is what you say, these are the questions that you have to, you know, deliver uh, to the network for them to understand what you're selling. And that's a very, a very important thing because they hear so many pitches, they, you know, what makes your pitch different? Um, I had one client who's an amazing writer and he cannot talk in a room. He just can't talk and he's reading pages, he's not looking at anybody and he was a disaster. And then finally I said to him one day, I said, just go in and tell a story. Just go in and talk to them and tell a story. And he, and he succeeded and he put a show on the air that was very successful about a year after that. And it's, so you have to find your way to get in the room and, and figure out what you want to uh, accomplish in the room. But the most important thing is you have to say everything about your show. And that's more important today than it is uh, probably five years ago or 10 years ago because the, the, the shows now are better than they were. The, you know, when I first started in the business, if a writer had an idea, you just called the network and you said, great, let's set a meeting. And nowadays they want to, uh, they want to talk about what the idea is with you. They want the writer to do a log line. So they're very particular about what they're buying. And I think the, the bar is, is higher. The standard is, is higher now than it was. So the pitch has to be better. Uh, and everything has to be a lot more prepared when you go in the room. There are some people who can go in the room and they're very, you know, they've made many shows and they have a relationship with the network and they can talk a little bit easier than most other people, but there are very few people that do that. And I think unless you're one of those people and you have the relationship or you're in a deal, you know, if you're in a deal with the network, they're, they're, they have to buy something from you. So some, I've seen pitches that aren't that great that they have to buy anyway and the show gets on the air, but that's very rare. Most of the time you have to be incredibly well prepared. Uh, you have to have any question that's going to come your way about the show, you have to have an answer for. So you have to think about it. And there's no wrong answer, but you always have to be open to maybe a different direction. So think about the the different direction that you may take the story because that you may get a question like that. Um, you also may want to have an idea who the actors are that you see. Um, you also may want to have an idea of, you know, people now are pitching the entire first season. Um, and the one thing that Americans, Americans never did, uh, we never had uh, a treatment, uh, like a big treatment. Um, a treatment can be 8, 10, 12 pages, but a lot of the other countries, I think you guys do as well, but a lot of other countries do an entire treatment, they do a lot of development, and then they go out and sell the show. And and you have a really good idea. There was a show from Israel that was a paper, we call it a paper format. Uh, it was called Wisdom of the Crowd and it never sold in Israel, but the guy in Israel who um, is an agent over there, actually, there's only one or two agents in Israel. Um, but the biggest agent in Israel said, you know what, I think this is a good idea for the American market. He, he made a few calls and they bought it and it got on the air and it, it only lasted one year. But it was a very good idea because he, the, the writer put together a 15 page treatment on what the show is. And now, um, I don't know if you guys watched that show Bloodline, the Netflix show. So the guys that went in there to pitch that show pitched five years. They put, they had it whole crafted for five years uh, and Netflix ordered it to series uh, without even reading a script. So, you know, it's important to have the most, you know, prepared pitch you can have. 
um, and any question that they may answer, you know, is, is, is just, you have to be prepared for that. And, and again, there's no wrong answer. You, you make choices, but always be open to, um, okay, what if they think something else or what if they think that it should be different? Then always have an answer and explain to them why, why you think that. Um, pilot script. Um, again, that's, that's sort of, you know, you're already in business with somebody, but what we do, the people that have success in our world are, they're developing an outline. And what the outline does is basically craft everything that you're doing, uh, everything you're going to write in the script, and it basically launches the story. Because when you're, you're pitching a, a, a show um, and you, you sell it to them, there's a lot that a lot of development that goes in. It takes us about six months to write a script in, in with a network because you, you hand in an outline, they give you notes on it, and sometimes you can be getting notes on an outline for two or three months. So it can be a very long process. But the outline helps you write the script, and I think it helps you write a better script. It also makes the network more invested in what the story is, and they've told you that this is where they want to go. And a lot of times, you know, we don't like to hear it, but the network is ultimately the boss, and they're the, going to be the deciding uh, factor in picking up the show. So you have to make them happy with whatever you're writing. So the outline is really, really important in, for that reason. Um, I also think that that when you write an outline, I think that it makes it easier to write the script. I think you can write it. Some writers I have write a script in two or three weeks. That's fantastic because they put so much work into the outline that it's not, you know, going to script is not that big a deal. You're not writing a blank page. You're, you're just filling it in. You're filling in dialogue. And so it's, it's a good, very good process to do that. Um, and producers, it's, it's, you know, very simple. In, in, in our world, in drama, uh, there was only, I don't think there was, actually, I don't think there's any show that doesn't have a producer on it. So you have your writer, and even if your writer's a showrunner, every single show in America has a producer on it. And that, that's an important thing because a show is, is, you know, it's a big process. There's lots of things to do. And a producer can help you with everything from actually producing the show, but also with relationships for casting, with relationships for directors, whatever you need to do. A producer is, is one of the most important partners that you could have if you're a writer. And it does it say the room. Yes, OK. So the room, um, do you guys do writer's rooms here sometimes? People are starting to do more of that. If it's a, a bigger show, they, they tend to do that. But if you, you know, writer's room is a specific thing. Um, but if you hire writers or you hire freelance, you know, scripts out, you want to make sure you hire the best writers. And obviously, a lot of people hire your friends, people you know, and that's, that's important too. But you want to hire the best writers that you can. Um, we've, we've had a lot of problems with people that they don't get a good script and they have to rewrite the script and it holds up the show. Uh, we've had shows that had to stop production because they had to rewrite the script. So it's always important to do that. Um, and it's the same thing for this one too. The, the next, the next thing is the scripts. It's, um, that's sort of like being an outline. It's be as prepared as you can before you actually go off and write the script. And the more you have prepared, the better the better it is. Uh, and the same thing for casting and directors. You know, um, actors are critical in, in our world. You have to have at least one actor that's a star. Um, and not only do they have to be very good, but if people have seen them before, um, it makes a big help to promote a show. You know, we have we have about 500 TV shows in the United States, and it's impossible to get promoted. It's impossible to get attention and people to watch. If and you could have a great show, but if you don't have something to promote, then it's it's really hard to do that. So casting becomes really critical. And also, um, you know, sometimes we have people that go off and make a show, and if they don't have a they they produce a show, they do independent financing for TV. And that's never a good idea unless you have a, a, a really good actor because uh, even a show that's very good, if no one recognizes any of the people in the show, they're not going to put it on the air, even for a lower amount of money. So we, we took out a show uh, that a guy, a, a client who's on the film side, happened to finance a show for about $300,000 an episode, 10 episodes, so it was $3 million. And it was actually a really good show. But there were no star actors in there. It was a lot of secondary actors, and no one wanted to put it on the air because 
even though they wanted to meet him and they wanted to talk to him and they wanted to know what else he had as far as ideas for TV shows, they didn't want to buy that show, even for a low amount of money, because it doesn't have a star. And you think in the world where you have Netflix and Amazon and you have uh, CBS All Access, you have a lot of shows up there, you'd think that there would be a place for a show, but if, if it doesn't have a recognizable name, then they, do, they just don't want to put it on. So casting is, is very, very important. And now we're on themes and concepts. Is that what it says? Uh, so this, this goes back to the, a little bit we, we discussed before, but um, you know, finding the, the right themes and concepts that, that hit emotional chords in anything that you're doing, uh, even if it's a comedy, um, you know, we always, we, you know the show Cheers from the United States? It was, it went on the air in 1983. It was the last show on TV that year. It was the last ranked uh, show, last lowest rated show. And it ended up staying on the air for 10 or 11 years and it became the number one show. And a lot of people call it a drama that had a funny joke at the end of every scene. So, you know, it was about people that didn't want to go home uh, they just wanted to go to this bar, and that was their that was their home. They didn't really have a home to go home to, right? They had a, a postman who went to the bar in his postal uniform. Um, it was it had a lot of heart to it. You had you know a woman who was very very smart. She didn't want to. She was a PhD. She didn't want to leave the bar. She didn't want to go out to the real world because she was too afraid to to fail. Um, you had an ex baseball player who you know, still is living like he's a professional baseball player and behind the bar and because he can still, still tell his stories and do all that. So it's very important to construct a show and I think that's the perfect show. Uh, the perfect show that's on today is Modern Family. And I think you guys, uh, you have that here. I think it's a big show around the world and Big Bang Theory. And and structurally, those are perfect shows, right? So you have an, an older man who's married to a woman who's much more attractive than he is. And unless she was from another country, I don't think that they would be married. That's just my opinion. Um, his children are a, a alpha female and a, and a gay man who is also very timid. Um, that's also something in the world that we live in now that's different. Um, and then the kids are, you know, you have normal kid problems still, but you have a structure of a show where you have, you know, what's going on in the world today. You have a second marriage, you have an older man, younger woman, you have um, a woman from another country marrying someone, you have a gay couple, you have a, uh, a woman who bosses her husband around, you know, you, you have things that are different and, and, and unique, and it works, and it works really well, and it's the number one, number one show for a while, I think Big Bang Theory is now number one, but they've always been the top two shows, and the Big Bang Theory is simple, it's, you know, uh, very smart people, and, you know, there we we like to laugh at them they laugh at themselves and they do fun things and they're um you know we call them nerds and they're cute and you know and the girl that lives across the hall you know is not one of them and they're fascinated by her and so they develop a friendship and it's really not a complicated structure but it's about it's about people who um who aren't perfect it's about people who aren't attractive necessarily um, it's about people who are socially awkward and how do, how do you go through life when you're very, very smart and maybe you will be successful one day and you'll have a lot of money, but you don't, you don't even know how to talk to the girl across the hall because you're, you just can't do it. You're just too afraid to do it. So it's, there's a lot of things like that, that you want to, you want to be, you have to be relevant if you want to be, I think, um, in a successful TV situation, you want to be, um, connecting to what people want to talk about. Uh, in the world, you know. Um, so we're, we're on anecdotes. Um, this is again going back to um, one of the things, if especially to sell an original idea. But even if you don't, like I, I just had a a woman who um, uh, she she just sold a show that's connected to politics, and when she her mother is 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 white and her father is black. Um, and then her, her mother's family was, was uh, wealthy. And when, when she was born, uh, her family was, was not happy that, that you know, the mother had, had had a baby with a black man. And this is going back, you know, this is 1970 now uh, in Boston. And, uh, and so her, they didn't give her any inheritance. They didn't give her any money. And so her mother 
had to go, this is a woman who went to college and, you know, but she has a small baby now and she had to go on uh, to a job assistance program and a welfare program. At the time, there was a man named Tip O'Neill and he was the top Democrat in the United States and he used to go against Ronald Reagan all the time. And he was from Massachusetts, from Boston, where she was from. And he had a, a personal um, uh, connection to the welfare program. He, he, he basically drew up the welfare program in Massachusetts at the time. And this woman, my client's writer, uh, her mother, went to, to this program and if and that helped helped her get her back on her feet. It, they found her a low low cost housing. They gave her I don't know what the amount of money is, but enough money to live on before she get a job, um, everything like that. So um, the show that that she sold was about the American political system in the late nineteen seventies and early eighties. And it had uh, three people who were in the government at the time who were very, very big prominent people. And they went out to be to look for a writer, and she went in the room and she said, "I know exactly how it works. I know exactly how this went on. I majored in in college in um, a, cla a, a, a a minor degree in what the American government does, the House of Representatives, the Congress does." And she went in the room and she told that story, which was a direct story from what these people were trying to sell. So it was a direct connection to the American government in the early, you know, late 70s, early 80s, and she got the job. They didn't. They had. They met with many great writers, and she got the job because she had that personal connection. Um, there's a show on the air right now that that, you know, is very hard to sell. It's a comedy. It's a period piece comedy in the early 70s about an Irish family, and it's the real life story of um, of the writer. It's basically his whole entire life. There's another show that you guys might know about. It's called The Goldbergs. And it's another story about the 80s being a Jewish family in the suburbs in the 80s. It's, again, the writer's exact life. So, and then when you look at uh, Blackish is also on ABC. That's his story, um, uh, the writer. And he went in and pitched the same thing. So there, it's very important when you, you have a personal connection to whatever you're trying to sell. You can't always do that. But if you can find a personal connection, it's it's by far, um, you know, an important way to get into the conversation. It also, it also uh, gives the buyer a little more, uh, um, it, it, it makes them more comfortable that you understand the material and you can, you can write the material for many episodes. And that's, you know, something that's important, obviously, as well. Um, I think the world is, is, uh, you know, so so just back on the personal story, a lot of times when you do a pitch, you want to lead with a personal story at the very beginning. You want to say, oh, I found this book, and here's why it means so much to me. Oh, this is what my life was like when I was a kid, and now I want to write about it. You know, something like that. Um, so it's always op good to open a story like that. You you get a little personally involved. You make you break the ice in the room, and they, they have a much more... I think they look at you differently when you have a personal connection to the material and why you want to tell the story. It's very important to do that. Um, why do the world? Why do a TV show about it at all? Um, that's important because if if we're not, many many people have to watch TV shows, obviously, right? So you can't. As much as maybe there's some great stories out there, if they only connect to a few people, those are going to be very hard to sell. So you want to you want to connect to you know, you want to do something that's important, you want to do something that is relevant to many people, or as many as possible, you don't want to do something that's a very small, has a very small audience. And even though it might be a great show, that's going to be very hard to sell. Um, characters. So a lot of times um, in, in, you know, uh, you have, and again, going back to the personal connection, obviously, if you're telling a story about your own life and, and what your family was like, what your father and mother were like, um, those are characters. Those are unique characters because you actually know them. You actually, you know, they raised you and now you can talk about them. Um, but characters are critical because characters are what gets you many episodes. The stories, you don't, you can't pitch all the stories. You can only pitch usually one or two stories in a pitch. Sometimes you don't pitch a story at all. As long as you have great characters, you have a show. You have something that could be a show. Because even, again, you go to, okay, well, this show in a bar is Cheers, and it's amazing. Well, this show is also in a bar. It was a disaster. Uh, there was a show last year on NBC about a woman who opened a bar in her backyard, and it was just, it just wasn't any, it just wasn't a good show. 
because the characters weren't complete. Um, you know, and when you look at um, you look at a show like Friends, you know, Friends is is not a show that has any. You, you wouldn't tell the story in the pitch. You would just say who those people are, why they're doing what they're doing, how they're living across the, the hall from each other, and they're just trying to figure out life in their you know mid mid to late twenties. And it's those characters that that make that show funny. It's not you know they find the story later because the show was on for I don't know fifteen years. Um, and it was the last, it was, it's our last, the last top show in the United States. It was the last show that got, um, you know, just massive ratings. I mean, it, 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 it got, I think about a, a 12 share in the demo it was the last show to do that. And the next, the next, all the shows after that got about a six or a seven. Um, so it was, it was really the last great show, uh, in American television. And it was those characters cause you love those characters, you know, so that it's the most important part of it all. I also think that the characters um, make the story different. There's there's been so many stories that have been told by many people in many different countries, and you know it's hard to find a unique story. But those characters to make them unique and make it personal uh, is the most important thing I think you can do. And I think you know a lot of times I've seen pitches sell, and they just set up the world, and then they do the characters. They do no story. And the people buy the pitch, so it's it's really important to do that. And so now the the pilot, um, this is this is something that it's important to talk about in a room, but you can't always you don't always get this question. But they may ask you, what does the show look like from week to week? What am I what am I tuning in to watch? And I will tell you that a lot of my experience now is that. There are shows now, you know, there are some shows on Netflix and Amazon that you watch. You can watch all 10 episodes or 12 episodes, whatever it is, the whole season, right? Then there are other shows that you have to wait every week to watch. And I think that there's so much going on that if the audience cannot look at the TV show, look at the screen, and understand what's happening in that show. And we, we have a lot of uh, police shows on the air. Um, we have a lot of medical shows, so if your show is set in a hospital, okay, I get it. They're trying to save that person's life. Um, okay, I get it. They're, you know, they're the two doctors are in love, whatever it is. A lot of shows, like soap opera shows, you you don't have that. You don't have that same thing. You have to, you know, people can get lost in the, um, you know, lost in in the season. So in other words, like a show like The Killing. You know that they're trying to solve. It's ten episodes, but you know they're trying to solve a crime. You know what happened. Um, if you, if you, if your audience can't look at the screen and understand what's happening, and they get lost in in the story, I think that's a problem. Um, so I think you have to, you know, find whatever it is like a high concept idea. Uh, find a a way to make it so that they know what's going on. And I think the show Bloodline. Um, would be a good example of that. Uh, the show was about a family in Florida, and they owned an inn. Uh, it was a dysfunctional family, obviously. Otherwise, it was the perfect happy family. You know, it might not be on TV, but it was a dysfunctional family. And the only reason that show worked is because when you had the top actors uh, in all of American television, uh, great writers, and the only reason that show worked is because at the end of the pilot, you see one of the. It's about three brothers and a sister. And their parents are the ones that own this uh, bed and breakfast hotel in Florida. You see one of the brothers carrying the body of the other brother, and they're all they're in suits. So you know that they were at a wedding or they were at some event, um, and he's dead, and he's getting rid of the body. So all of a sudden, that's different. You know, you now look at that show differently. Like I'm seeing, you know, the dysfunctional brother comes home, and I'm seeing the sister and. She's got her problems. The other brother's a police officer. He's got, you know, he seems like he has his life together. He has a wife and two kids. Um, but now I know what's going to happen. I know that this guy's going to kill this other brother. And now you think to yourself, okay, that's something interesting. How the heck does a family, how does a brother kill another brother in, in this situation? So you're very interested all of a sudden in finding out why that is. And now you're going to watch for at least five or six more episodes, you're now a little more invested in the show. 
Um, and I think once they, they solved that problem, they had a, a lot of, the season two was okay because they were trying to cover it up. But then season three was, uh, people didn't watch because there was nothing new. Uh, you can't keep the story going for too long. So, but that's an example of a high concept idea so that people know what's, what's happening when they're, you know, if you're doing a show that's serialized where each episode is not its own show, uh, then you have to, I think, do something that makes the people understand what's what's going on at all times, and it's a very critical part of the show. Um, tone um, is another thing that that um, oh, just on the on the pilot, you should you should say how, what an episode looks like, and so you know wh how you open, what are the stories, what are the what's the A story, what's the top story, what's the the B story. Um, or the C story. So everything that's going on in, in an episode, you should be able to talk about. Tone uh, basically means very simply what what how edgy is the show? How funny is it? How dark is it? Um, you know, so you should have a, an answer for that, and you should be able to maybe give examples of a show that you feel like it's it's the same tone, or a movie. You can give a movie example as well. <clears throat> and then a week to week, very important. Um, a little bit related to, um, you know, the pitch as far as the questions that you're going to get, but you have to have it really well worked out how the show is week to week. Um, you know what what the what the what this character is going to do this season maybe what's what's that character going to do for this season, and basically where where the show's going and where does it where does it live. Um, where where every week are we going to find more stories? Like you you want to be able to demonstrate that in the pitch. So if you're in you know again that's why there's so many police and hospital shows and law shows on the air because they're a lot easier. You're in a you're in a hospital. Well, someone's getting sick this week, right? So that's the A story. Um, but what's this character's journey? Is this character going to fall in love with that character? Is this character going to get addicted to drugs this week? Is that, the, you know, for the season, whatever it is. So you want to be able to tell those stories and you want to be able to, you know, have an idea as to how, how it unfolds over the course of, of a season. And then also, um, you know, if you, have, if you have what you think is a closed-ended series, I have, I have a client right now pitching and he's convinced this show is four years. Um, I don't know that you want to go say that to a network that you only get four years. Um, it's a very high concept idea. It's a very, um, but I would say that you know if you, it's a it's a very violent show. It's it's a CIA in the Middle East type of show. Um, but I, if I if you look at a show like Homeland, I don't think you say we all know that the show ends the second he dies. And I think they got three seasons out of it, and it was. For me, it was a little too long. I think two seasons would have been better when he dies. But right after you die, he dies, um, you have a problem trying to figure out where the show goes. And, and very few people tuned in after that. They kept it on the air, but it was very hard to keep that show on the air. So you should you should have an idea as to where it goes, but um, you know, be be very clear that that it can keep going if it if you need. But maybe you haven't figured that out yet. But here are the first four years. And then, you know, I think that's enough when you're trying to sell a show. Um, but, but never tell them that it's only one season or it's only two seasons. I think keep it going as long as possible. Muchas gracias por la atención y creo que merece un aplauso de ustedes.